Hello, everybody. Today I am really inspired to read um, a lesson from A Course in Miracles. And today it is lesson 161, Give Me Your Blessing, Holy Son of God. And I found that um, a little while ago now, I uh, sat on the couch and was eager to go within. And over the last few days, I have been reading Autobiography of Yogi, by Yogananda. And it has truly, deeply motivated me to be as still as often as I can and to no longer wait for that time of peace with God, but to take a moment and retreat inward and remember that He's always there and then to respond in my world from that place. So I've noticed that over the last few days it has been still within me, in my world, as I have been learning, right? Learning more deeply about what's happening and um, truly what comes from realizing uh, the old purpose in which we bestowed upon our lives and in our relationships and accepting the new purpose in our relationships and in our life. And um, so I have been learning what comes from the acceptance of our true divine purpose, which is God's will. And so since I've been reading Autobiography of Yogi, um, I've been really introduced to him, our brother, um, and grateful for his demonstration. But then I've found that I haven't picked up the course in a couple days when that would normally be my regular practice. And so today when I sat on the couch, I was inspired to open it up again. And I've read this lesson before, but this time it is with a fresher, new awareness and understanding of what's going on. And that's what I'm so grateful for. It's a constant increase in clarity when our focus and, and our, our intent is God, is to know ourselves. And so I felt very inspired to share in this with all of you today um, and to kind of add that this course lesson isn't just a course lesson, it's a practical learning guide. That if we truly want peace and, and desire to know our true selves, then this lesson can give it to us. It's handed to us on a silver platter. All we have to do is say yes. <laughs> so... I'm going to read it through. Give me your blessing, Holy Son of God. Today we practice differently and take a stand against our anger that our fears may disappear and offer room to love. Here is salvation in the simple words in which we practice with today's idea. Here is the answer to temptation, which can never fail to welcome in the Christ where fear and anger had prevailed before. Here is atonement made complete. The world passed safely by and heaven now restored. Here is the answer of the voice for God. And with this simple paragraph here, Jesus is reminding us that the peace and the love of God is whole unto itself. It is not separate, it does not have separate parts, it does not include anger, and it does not include fear. But that if we are experiencing fear or anger in our lives, it is because we've held on to our old purpose that we've established for the individual self instead of accepting our united self, which is shared with God and each other. And so through this first paragraph, he is reminding us that in choosing love, this love is a completely new level of consciousness, a completely new vision, a completely new voice that we listen to within. And it is the voice from the voice for God, reminding us that we are these holy sons of God and that we cannot suffer or experience pain. So Jesus is pointing us there, inward, to listen to that.
complete abstraction is the natural condition of mind. But part of it, but part of it is now unnatural. It does not look on everything as one. It sees instead but fragments of the whole, for only thus could it invent the partial world you see. The purpose of all seeing is to show you what you wish to see. All hearing but brings to your mind the sounds it wants to hear. And as I pause for a moment, when we are looking upon the world through the body's eyes, we do not see it as one. We see it fragmented and separate. We see separate bodies with separate stories coming from different families and backgrounds around the world with different beliefs and ideas. So when we grow up in this world believing that we are this body, our eyes and our ears show us and bring to our, our listening what it is that we are asking for. And at first, what we are asking for is to be a part of this world, to be separate, to have that experience of being a body who can live its own life and support itself and do all these things for itself. And as we continue, Jesus reminds us and teaches us that there's another vision in place of this, that no longer is it separate and fragmented, but we do see the one. Thus were specifics made, and now it is specifics we must use in practicing. We give them to the Holy Spirit, that he may employ them for a purpose which is different from the one we gave to them. Yet he can use but what we make to teach us from a different point of view, so we can see a different use in everything. So this is our practice. Anytime we see something as separate, to hand it over to the Holy Spirit, to ask to see it differently, to ask for a new purpose to be laid upon it that is not our own. Because when we have our own purpose, that's where we get angry and, and we feel this intent to kill or to harm right? We feel like victims, right? All of these different attributes come from this false purpose. But when we recognize these separate ideas in our mind is when we can hand them over so that we can be taught from a new perspective, from a new point of view of the Holy Spirit, of this voice for God, what is actually going on. But we first must step out of the way and be like, oh yeah, I don't know what's happening here because I'm not at peace. So I hand it up to you, voice for God. Thank you for showing this to me differently. And this next paragraph is one of my favorite parts. One brother is all brothers. Every mind contains all mind, for every mind is one. Such is the truth. Yet do these thoughts make clear the meaning of creation? Do these words bring perfect clarity with them to you? What can they seem to be but empty sounds? pretty perhaps, correct in sentiment, yet fundamentally not understood nor understandable. The mind that taught itself to think specifically can no longer grasp, grasp abstraction in the sense that it is all-encompassing. We need to see a little that we learn a lot. And the reason I love this so much is because when we truly question, do I understand the depth of the meaning and perfect clarity and honesty, what this sentence means? One brother is all brothers. Every mind contains all minds, for every mind is one. When we're learning spirituality, it's easy to say, yes, we are all one, and just pass it on by as if we already know. But until we have this unwavering depth to this understanding that is in perfect clarity that can be applied in every single moment of our days to be experienced in perfect peace, then we have yet to know the depths of this meaning, and that's okay. But it's almost being honest to ourselves that it is so, so that we can be shown from a new mind the meaning of this sentence. Because when we are looking upon it with the mind of the body, with the mind of the ego, we won't see it truly. It will be just words. But when we give it to the Holy Spirit, it is when the Holy Spirit carries us into deeper meaning and understanding, which is far beyond these words in this book and this world. 
And that's why Jesus say, says we need to see a little that we learn a lot. All we need to see is this little sentence to learn everything. And it truly is that simple. Salvation truly is that simple. But we will only understand the true meaning of that when we are so, so open and so, so willing for it to be. And if we're that willing, all we need to do is ask and it's given us. There's nothing preventing this from happening now. Except our unwillingness. <laughs> It seems to be the body that we feel limits our freedom, makes us suffer, and at last puts out our life. Yet bodies are but symbols of a concrete form of fear. Fear without symbols causes for, calls for no response, for symbols can stand for the meanings. Love needs no symbols, being true, but fear attaches to specifics being false. Now an example of this is the body-mind's idea of what love is. Love thinks that it has to do with a particular body or a particular person or a particular someone. And if that particular person or someone doesn't treat you in the appropriate way in which you want them to treat you, then they can be, could be considered horrible or bad or wrong and, you know, they have this opportunity to leave and separate from you because they're in this body, <laughs> right? And a lot of the time, this idea of love, whether it be a special love or a special love-hate, um, what it is is it's generally speaking um, body to body, right? Whether that be male to female, whether you want to call that man and wife, whether you want to call that couple, whether you want to call that closeness, and it can even be with children, right? Any type of relationship like that. But it always has to do with if this body wasn't here, I'd be missing something. Or if this body wasn't here, I'd be happier, right? Either way, it's in the same direction. So a lot of the time, the body is used as, t as a temptation. So if you have these special love or special hate relationships with your partner, for instance, you would cringe and feel guilty if you were to go out and sleep with somebody else, or you would feel shunned and, and hurt and in pain if they went to go sleep with somebody else. Right? It's this idea of your love being attached to this body and not your love being with the Holy Son of God himself. <laughs> right, So it's a different idea of love. One is the, the ego's idea of love because it identifies with the body, and one is the idea of love because it is God's. Right, And so we are here recognizing that love needs no symbol of the body, that love just is. And love is infinite, and it's found inward. It's not found in a body, it's not found in somebody else. Right, But this fear of love attaches to the body and feels that if this body isn't here or does something particular to you, that something's gone wrong, which is not so. And Jesus further goes on here. Bodies attack, but minds do not. Right, Bodies attack, minds do not. This thought is surely reminiscent of our text, where it is often emphasized. This is the reason bodies easily become fear's symbols. You have many times been urged to look beyond the body, for its sight presents the symbol of love's enemy. Christ's vision does not see. The body is the target for attack, for no one thinks he hates a mind. Yet what but mind directs the body to attack? What else could be the seat of fear except what thinks of fear? Brilliant, right? Brilliant. And, and we always have this idea that, you know, this world is laden with war and, and pain and attack and death and sin and all of these things. But it's because this world believes themselves to be bodies, right? This world believes themselves to be this limited self that's contained within a body, within a home, within a country, right? This thought is literally, literally just the false thought of fear projected outward in form. So what we are learning is to no longer look at the body, but to look beyond it to the Christ that was within. Because it is that Christ vision, that love, that never changes. But when we look to the body, then this vision of fear will always change. It's always changing, right? And so we must remember that the body, you know, has no mind of its own. The body responds to what the mind tells it. So if the body's feeling a sense of attack or anger or frustration or jealousy or pain, those are all extensions of fear. 
So when we recognize that within ourselves as, as meaning something or that it's actually real, um, then what we are being guided by is this mind of fear, right? Because this mind of fear is what directs the body to attack in some particular way. It can't be any other way. If we were being guided by the mind of love, by the mind of Christ, then attack would be impossible. Impossible. Because we know we are not these bodies and we cannot experience pain. And so it's a totally new vision that we're asking for here. A totally new vision that we're calling upon here. Because at the current time we're not seeing it as so. And it can't be partially seen. So as I continue. Hate is specific. There must be a thing to be attacked. An enemy must be perceived in such a form he can be touched and seen and heard and ultimately killed. When hatred rests upon a thing, it calls for death as surely as God's voice proclaims there is no death. Fear is insatiable, consuming everywhere its eyes behold, seeing itself in everything, compelled to turn upon itself and to destroy. Now, an easy example of this came to my mind earlier when I was reading this, even with my beautiful mother, right? Like, if we go for walks, she's petrified, she's terrified that some man is going to be leaking, lurking around the corner to cause her pain or me pain in some way, right? It's this constant idea that there is someone out there to attack us, and we must protect ourselves from this attack, right? This is the main premise of this entire world, right? Um... But what this is really saying, right, is that we are believing that this body, this character in this dream is our reality because we are seeing that in them, thus we are giving that away and what we give we receive. So we're seeing ourselves as this vulnerable body that can be harmed and die. And therefore we're just living out the dream. We are asleep and we know no better. Right? And so this is how things such as war can transpire, because we believe that we are protecting ourselves by attacking that, that which we feel can attack us, which is insane unto itself. Right? Who sees a brother as a body, sees him as fear symbol. Exactly. If we are afraid of another body hurting this body, then we're not seeing them truly. But there's other stories that we hear about that if you come across somebody else and let's say they're trying to rob you and they're trying to take your stuff from you, well, give it to them. <laughs> it's just stuff, right? You don't have to run away. Hello, everybody. Come in. And funny, as I'm speaking, that the body is nothingness, Tabitha comes in and we discuss what we're having for dinner. <laughs> so that's a big thing that I've been learning too, especially with this Yogananda book, right? That we are here to practice the presence of God, but we're not here to neglect our earthly duties, right? We're still here for a function and for a purpose. And when that new purpose is given us, we see why we're doing what we're doing. And it can be done in the waves of peace. So when we do dishes after and make dinner, it will be filled with joy, <laughs> right? So that's just another demonstration. <laughs> Um, I'm going to continue here. Hmm. Who sees a brother as a body sees him as fear's symbol. And he will attack because what he beholds is his own fear external to himself, poised to attack, and howling to unite with him again. Ooh, I like that. Mistake not the intensity of rage projected fear must spawn. It shrieks in wrath and claws in the air and frantic hope it can reach to its maker and devour him. Wow, this is the extent of how the mind of fear will attack, right? And it must attack the other because it believes that that's what's in itself. So to protect itself of all of its private thoughts and everything that's happened in the past, it says, I don't want to experience this anymore. So you, a person that you're spending my life with, you're responsible for me not feeling this way. And if you don't do what I tell you to do in my mind subconsciously, well, then you have done something wrong. So I am going to find everything wrong with you. I'm going to find everything that you've done wrong and need to do better. I'm going to attack you. I'm going to get mad at you. I'm going to get sad. I'm going to feel like I'm the victim or the aggressor. And, and it is going to be hell because this is what I'm asking for. And mind you, this is all happening unconsciously that we don't really know it. 
But that is why stuff like this course lesson comes forward, so we can see our intended purpose that's hidden within the mind of fear, so that we can look upon it in the light, and in the light we see its insanity and absurdity, and we can let it go. And it is in the letting of the go, and it is in that making that space, is when our true purpose and the gift of sight and love will be given us in wholeness and in peace, right? But we need to see the depths of the craziness of fear and its wrath and its claws and let it come up. You know, we've seen that happen here, right? That, that you know, ego takes its projection, projects it on the other person, and they have this contorted experience of fear and attack and insanity only so it could be brought forward to be looked at to let go. But the willingness needs to be there in order for that to happen, <laughs> right? This do the body's eyes behold in one whom heaven cherishes, the angels love, and God created perfect. <laughs> this is his reality. And in Christ's vision is his lovingness reflected in a form so holy and so beautiful that you could scarce refrain from kneeling at his feet. Yet you will take his hand instead for you are like him in the sight that sees him thus. So everything that is rage and attack and jealousy and pain is what the body's eyes behold. And when we're seeing what the body's eyes behold, then we are not seeing that which is there that shines as heaven, that the angels love and God created perfect. So we're always choosing, am I going to see them as his body, or am I going to see them as God created them to be? And in that giving to our brothers, we are receiving. Attack on him is enemy to you, for you will not perceive that in his hands is your salvation. The only reason that these people come into our life to have these experiences that may seem torturous and painful and, and horrible is for the purpose of salvation. There's only one thing going on. There's only one son. And so because they are coming into our life, they are there to, for us to experience salvation. But we must be willing to see him as the Christ and as our Savior and not as our victimizer or this person that we hate. We have to be willing to, to be wrong about what we previously thought, what we previously believed, and be willing and open to see anew. And this is the forgiveness, right? This is the true miracle that we are receiving into our minds so that we can then give. Because then when we see them as holy and lovely and perfect as God created them to be, then that's the gift we are giving them that they can receive for themselves. And that's the gift we receive because we have given it. And together we have this experience of a profoundly beautiful miracle of joy that is nothing but incredible and to be intensified more and more from then on out. It's a beautiful thing. Ask him but for this, for salvation. Ask him but for this, and he will give it to you. Ask him not to symbolize your fear. Would you request that love just destroy itself? Or would you have it be revealed to you and set you free? That's the choice we always have to make, love or fear. Is love going to turn to hate? as we go through this up and down yo-yo roller coaster experience of a relationship? Or are we going to have love be revealed to us so that we m may both go free? Today we practice in a form we have attempted earlier. Your readiness is closer now. And you will come today near Christ's vision. If you are intent on reaching it, you will succeed today. That's how far your willingness can carry you, right? If you are intent on reaching it, you will succeed today. And once you have succeeded, you will not be willing to accept the witnesses your body's eyes call forth. 
refuse to see the witnesses that the body's eyes see. They are not a reality. What you will see will sing to you of ancient melodies you will remember. You are not forgot in heaven. Would you not remember it? And then here's the practice, everybody. This is the deep practice that just shot me into gratitude. Select one brother. Symbol of the rest. And ask salvation of him. See him first as clearly as you can in the same form to which you are accustomed. See his face, his hands, and feet his clothing. Watch him smile and see familiar gestures which he makes so frequently. Then think of this. What you are seeing now conceals from you the sight of one who can forgive you all your sins, whose sacred hands can take the nails which pierce your own away and lift the crown of thorns which you have placed upon your bleeding head. Ask this of him, that he may set you free. Give me your blessing, holy Son of God. I would behold you with the eyes of Christ, and see my perfect sinlessness in you. The most beautiful thing about this is this can be applied to any brother at any time and all we need is willingness and the Holy Spirit will guide us through this exercise we can see him for what we saw him as before and what we currently may even see him as now and then we remind ourselves of what we truly want is salvation to come of this and we are given a new sight in its place and in our brother that where we once saw maybe hatred or sadness or fear comes the sight of holiness, of perfection, of sinlessness, having done nothing wrong. And he will answer whom you called upon, for he will hear the voice of God in you and answer in your own. This prayer is to the Christ and our brothers, it's not to the ego. And when we sincerely call upon this as our only want and need, it will be received, it has to be received, it must be received, and it always is. Behold him now, whom you had seen as merely flesh and bone, and recognize that Christ has come to you. Today's idea is your safe escape from anger and from fear. Be sure you use it instantly, should you be tempted to attack a brother and perceive in him the symbol of your fear. And you will see him suddenly transformed from enemy to savior, from the devil into the Christ. So it is for all of us. <laughs> and I'm truly humbled to have shared this and feel it and resonate with it and know that it is true. And what more can be said after that, right? <laughs> Practice and experience is to be had, that is all. And so until next time, I love all of you. Thank you, and God bless. Give me your blessing, Holy Son of God.